So we go to the last chapter of 2 Corinthians. This will be uh, the final message on the 2 Corinthians at this particular segment. Uh, chapter 13 um, is where we will read. Uh, let me read from verse 1 to verse 10. Um, I would actually love to read bigger portion uh, from chapter 12, 14. Uh, but for the time's sake, I will just read this section. Uh, but I would actually, I will mention a broader context of this message. Chapter 13, verse 1. This is the third time I am coming to you. Uh, every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. I warn those who sinned before and all the others, and I warn them now while absent as I did when pre present on my second visit, that, I, if, that if I come again, I will not spare them, since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me. He is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Question mark. Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test, but we pray to God that you may not be wrong, that uh, not that we may appear to have met the test, um, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. For this reason I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come I may not have to be uh, severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. Amen. Uh, as you read this passage with me, I, I, I wonder what kind of sense uh, you had about this text. Um, I also trust that many of you, if not all of you, uh, spent some time this past week meditating on this text because it was assigned, uh, I believe, for last uh, Tuesday um, as a daily Bible reading and meditation. Uh, I think on one sense, I think you get a little confused about what exactly Paul here is trying to say to the uh, Corinthian church. Uh, what is he saying at the, at the very end of this letter? What, what, what kind of uh, um, statement is he making here? And I, I want to clarify that a little bit, and I want to uh, tie this to the fact that this is what Christ himself is actually doing to us and with us, uh, this is really about us, ultimately. This is really about Jesus Christ, even though uh, what we're looking at from the context of this passage is the relationship between Paul and the Corinthian church. Um, the main point, really, is what Paul is stating here in verse 1, that the third time I am coming to you. So Paul is now really literally planning to make this trip uh, he's not going to back down. He's actually going to go. Um, he states that uh, earlier in chapter 12, verse 14, here for the third time, I am ready to come to you. Uh, so he's going to come. So first time when he came was when he planted the church. The second time when he came, the whole meeting just backfired. It was horrible uh, because Paul was just mistreated and belittled. He was discredited, and he came away from that second trip as, a, as a, just a dejected man. And that whole, whole sentiment is deeply written into this letter. And um, uh, he, uh, instead of making the third trip to mend that situation right away, he actually wrote a letter uh, that was a very 
painful letter, or what Paul says, a very tearful letter. It was a letter full of emotion and also a very pointed, pointed um, uh, statements about what the Corinthians have done wrong and what some sinners have committed uh, that had deeply offended Christ uh, as well as Paul himself. So uh, this letter was sent to them, and what we find out in this letter, that, that, that second Corinthian letter that's preserved for us, right? This is actually the later letter than the letter that I just mentioned, which was not preserved for us. But anyway, this letter shows clearly that when the Corinthian church received that very painful letter, that very tearful letter, uh, they didn't reject it wholesale. In fact, many, many people uh, regained their passion for love of Paul. Okay? They, they realized that, that really they've done wrong to him. So they wanted to really reconcile with Paul. Uh, and also those who have uh, sinned against the Lord by uh, really sliding uh, their commitment to him. A uh, number of them had repented. And out of that repentance and remorse, something very positive came up. And this is what we find in chapter 7 of this letter. But now, finally, after this particular letter, Paul's going to visit them. Second Corinthians uh, wasn't easy uh, at all. I mean, this letter, though, was not as severe as the earlier letter that he sent, which is not preserved for us. But nevertheless, 2 Corinthians is a very serious letter. This is a very difficult letter. It's a full of emotion. It's full of Paul saying, you know, I am, I am an authentic apostle. Why do you slight me? And, and there's this um, uh, interaction that, that seems obviously very difficult and charged with emotion. But after this letter, Paul's basically telling them, I'm going to actually come to you now, finally, the third time, and I will come and deal with you. Now, um, this third visit obviously wasn't something that Paul was naturally looking forward to. Uh, I don't see a lot of positive like excitement about going, you know, as you read with me. I mean, it seems like the emotionally he's still like going back and forth here. So there's not a lot of positive excitement for going on this third trip to Corinth. Um, and the question may be, why then, right? We need to ask that question. Why isn't Paul very happy to go, even though he will go? Why, what's, what's, what, is, what is it that's kind of drawing him back? And this is very much tied to the message that I, I um, preached last Sunday about Paul's weakness where the sufficiency of Christ's grace is revealed, uh, and the nature of faith, remember, nature of faith as active, but it's receiving, it's receptive. So uh, faith itself tells us that by nature, Christianity, our faith is a sort of weakness. Uh, it's a confession that we cannot do it without Christ. We need Christ, all, all of Christ we need. There's nothing about ourselves that is going to um, survive. We need Christ through and through. So that's what faith is. Faith is an utter trust out of weakness, right? Remember, remember that's what I said? And that's exactly what Paul says. Paul reveals to the, to the Corinthian church, well, you guys had said things about me that were kind of degrading, but I'll tell you, I'll even go further to tell you that all these hardships happened to me, plus I have this thorn in my flesh. It, it's so severe that I, I had to ask the Lord to remove it three times, and yet he rejected it. Paul's telling the Corinthian church, my prayer was rejected. A series of prayers was rejected by the Lord. And I am a weak man. I'm a broken man. You see, he's, he's stating this to do what? To declare what faith means. And if the Corinthian church was a healthy church, if Corinthian church was a good church, so to speak, what would happen? Well, people would love that. People would welcome that. People would cherish that. You know, when somebody breaks down and basically tells everybody, this is my weakness, this is my sin, this is the trials I'm 
going through. You know, I'm suffering from this kind of problem. And initially, it may come to all those who are listening to this as a shock. But if the church is a healthy church, what would that church do? The church will embrace that person because that's the nature of faith. You know someone is weak, and in fact, we are all weak, and that's what faith is. We have faith, faith posture, which is a posture of weakness, not posture of, of, of power or strength. So we know that brokenness is welcomed here. That's a, that's a, that's a good church. But unfortunately, unfortunately, the Corinthian church doesn't seem to be that way. Isn't it sad? Chapter 12, verse 20. Listen. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and you may find me not as you wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you, that I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity sexual immorality and sensuality that they have practiced. See, what's, what's, what you're reading here is so vivid. It's so honest. What Paul's saying is, yes, I am coming for the third time, but, but I actually am very afraid. I am afraid that you will expose further my weakness. That when I show you my wounds, instead of trying to heal it, you're going to make the gap wider. You're going to increase my pain. You may. That's what he's saying. I'm afraid that though, yes, I heard good reports about you and how you changed your mind, but maybe when I come, it'll not be the same. Maybe when you see me, you know, you have said through Titus chapter 7 that, oh, we love Paul, or we care for him, but when you actually see me, you will not really do that. He says, I'm afraid that the ones who hadn't, haven't repented, you know, I, I heard some repented, but the fact is that there are many that have not yet repented, and they will continue to exhibit their impurity and immorality and sensuality. Wow. So the Corinthian church was a church that was not, I should say, then what? Full of faith. Full of faith. Faith is what? Faith is, uh, again, a willingness and, and, and obvious willingness because of what Christ had done for us to embrace one another's weakness and also to expose ourselves out of the desire to receive greater and further grace from God. That weakness is not you know, exposed as a shame, but rather it's put out there as the sign of God's great healing, Christ's great love and care. It's a great place for us to kind of visit where we are. You know, I think as a church, we can be very judgmental to one another. I think sometimes, um, not saying that this is what I see exactly from Jubilee, but it's possible that we could take the, the value systems of the world, which is based on power, accomplishments, glittering you know, proof of oneself as worthy because of certain greatness, that sense of worldly ac accomplishments come right into church and play out exactly the same way. <clears throat> uh, a church that is so caught up in this sense of accomplishments that whenever someone doesn't measure up, you know, that, that issue becomes a scandal. You see, when somebody comes weak before Christ, when somebody comes repentant before Christ, a faithful church is always going to be receptive and embracing that. You know, that's what happens in your small group. It should. It, it, I, I hope that your community group is not a place where you parade 
stuff that you can boast about. I hope it's not a place where you come and show off the good stuff you bought or great uh, trips you have taken or how well you're educating your kids with the elite training and how your new home is decorated with some new features. And I, I hope that, that sharing doesn't become a parading of your, your strength. Because that would be Corinthian church. They love the super apostles. Why? Because they look so impressive. They look so all together. They look rich. Paul, on the other hand, seems spent. He seemed worn out. He seemed not that exciting to look at. But they're missing the point. They're missing out that it's that, that faith weakness on which God's grace, the very power of Jesus' saving grace rests on. So we have, to, we have to really see ourselves in the light of what this passage is telling us. What kind of church ought us to be? Um, I, I was reading this, this short article um, by a, an old German theologian, and uh, he said something that's very relevant to the, to the COVID-stricken era um, or what will happen when technology grows so much that automation takes place to a high level and people literally have no work. You know, post-industrial revolution, people are measured by the work and the efficiency and it's the market economy that drives people to further greed. Production's based on that more and more and more and more. Everyone's dashing towards material success. Um, what happens when people begin to have no job? When we as a human being must define ourselves not based on what we do, but literally what we are. And, and he laments that the world, for now anyway, have lost the ability to be significant by being who he or she is as who he or she is. Everything's measured by what he does, what she does. What's your job? How much do you make? What's your net worth? You know, stuff that's all about the accomplishments, because that's, that's, that's how we're conditioned. Unfortunately, people look at the church the same. I think people look at a church by the building size, what it looks like, how expensive the place looks. And you love going to these very imposing-looking places that people call church. Well, that's not church. Church is the community. It's the people. And sometimes we are impressed by how good people we have Good people. And what that means is that people are highly efficient. People don't drag their feet. It's like people are efficient enough that I don't really need to help them. You know, and, and, and this, this theologian explores the very nature of <clears throat> human being as one who's related to God. <clears throat> What will be the state of our ultimate glory in the heavenly blessing? <clears throat> when we are in that heavenly blessing, will we be judged by how much work we do? What will be the very worth of ourselves? What's the worth of what we are? And, and one idea that he gives is that you need to enjoy God. <laughs> we need to learn to enjoy God as who he is and enjoy ourselves in relation to him. Not by what we do, not by the works, but by the wonderful great grace of creation, redemption. Can we truly celebrate our humanness by enjoying arts, music and poetry, and wonderful exploration of imagination? of the beauty and the wonders 
of this divine grace and love. And one thing he does say is that can church have agenda-free fellowship? That, that, that really hit me. Can we come because we love to come together? Because we all belong to Jesus. And all we can say is God is good. And I am so glad in the midst of hardship and the trials that I go through. Life is tough. But I don't have to prove myself here. I am here not to be approved. But I am here to be affirmed of God's grace for me. Agenda free in a sense of my agenda. What I have to do. What had to be done to me. But coming together as men and women to enjoy the joy of God. I love that. That seems so ideal. That seems heavenly. But, but isn't that lovely? Isn't that great? And, and what I see in this text is that that was absolutely lacking in the Corinthian church. They judged people. Now the question then is, why would Paul go anyway? Why couldn't he just give up? Isn't this something that I said in the very first message that I gave weeks ago? 2 Corinthians talks about Paul's continual engagement with the Corinthian church when it was still so painful for him. Why did he do that? Why was it necessary? But he did. Why? I have the same question. Why would he go the third time? Knowing that he could get hurt. Well, one question we could have is, did he go? Did he really go, historically speaking? And uh, I won't go into the detail, but uh, all the details, but yes, according to the letter to Romans, chapter 15, verse uh, 26, it seems very clear that Paul did manage to go, and uh, he followed up on his promise, and that he requested them to follow up on their promise. And uh, it happened. So what do we learn from this? We learn the nature of uh, covenant faithfulness. The relationship of covenantal relation, uh, uh, relationship of covenantal nature that, that, that ultimately is what is the very relationship that we have with our God. You know, our God's relationship with us, our, our Lord Jesus Christ, relationship with us is what we call the covenant relationship. It's like a marriage. It's like a faithful contract. And this relationship is not something that's flaky. It's not a relationship that you can just have and not have. This relationship is going to feature a couple things. One, it's going to be uh, just... Absolutely honest. It's based on truthfulness. It's like a marriage based on truthfulness. Like husband is not hiding something behind. A wife is not hiding something behind. There's a sense of absolute truthfulness. So it's just outright honest. Jesus will tell you as is. His covenant relationship to us is not going to be beating around the bush and kind of, you know, covering us up. You know, he will not. He will expose our sins not to kill us or break us, but to change us, to love us, to make us glorious. The other feature of this covenant relationship is it's going to be utterly, stubbornly faithful and loving. We call that has said love. We call that loving faithfulness. Love is oftentimes portrayed as a a fleeting feeling, and therefore we have to use that word faithfulness, loving faithfulness, to to really convey the meaning of the word has said. God will not give up on these people. Paul would not give up on the Corinthian church. Jesus would not give up on us. You know, that's what marriage is like, right? Right? The good marriage. Yeah, good marriage doesn't mean you have no struggle. Good marriage doesn't mean there's no, you know, hardship. You fight. Sometimes you expose the worst of you. But good marriage does what? It's steadfast. It continues. It endures. You don't throw it out. 
This is so against our culture, isn't it? We're so individualistic. We're so instant gratification oriented. We have no patience. Church becomes flaky. Why? Because people don't commit. Well, even if you commit, so what? After a while, that commitment becomes nothing. You know, we may be ordained or something like that, but what does that mean? It's kind of strange too because there's so many people that are ordained into ministry that are not doing ministry among this culture. And I'm not, I'm not saying if you're ordained, you know, you got to do it. You have to make a best judgment. But there's something about the f- sort of shakiness of commitment. You just do what you like to do and you don't do what you don't like to do. And every morning you wake up to figure out what to do or not to do. And that's certainly not has said love. See, it, this is countercultural. <clears throat> Millennials may not understand this well in terms of their, you know, right to the skin feeling, exact, you know, kind of sense of what it is. Because it's hard to understand when nothing's stable, you know. How many people get into a relationship of marriage saying, this is going to be lifetime? I mean, I, I do that all the time when I sit, sit them down and do counseling. And, and are, you, are you sure? And sometimes I don't feel very sure myself. And I say, don't do it. And that's painful. I know that's painful. Uh, but people say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to love one another for eternity. But really, you know, once that feeling kind of fades, and how many people will say, I made a promise, so I have to stay. I made a promise, so I have to stay. <clears throat> you know, some people had asked me, why do you stay in that denomination? Now, this is a bit of a secret. <laughs> why, why do you stay in your denomination knowing that uh, your, your denomination is, has done some stuff that just seems so not right? And I've said, Without shame, I said, well, it's because of my ordination vows. You know, unless there's an extraordinary reason why I must, I will stay and fight. I will do what I can to participate and change things for better if I can. But I will not simply take this on and then strip that off and take that on and strip that off. I won't go from place to place every five years. Why? Because I don't think that's right. (laughs) You know, it doesn't, doesn't mean, you know, you just make uh, uh, your life um, very happy simply by staying. No, I don't think that's, that's what it is. Happiness, what is happiness? It's a feeling that's fleeting, a sense of happiness anyway. It's not even joy. Joy has an object that's absolutely stable, and you rejoice in it. Right? But, but we're, we're here, right? And what loyalty do you have? You have loyalty to your job. Many, many people that are working for a company, four or five years, that's a long time. You skip from one place to the other because efficiency-wise, so much better. And I'm, not, I'm not preaching against that, but I'm just saying, culturally speaking, maybe we've gotten so used to simply, you know, just accepting the fact that, well, things are instant. You know, I... I, I, I I just do it because I like it for now. And tomorrow when it seems wrong or not right, I'll just let go. And that's exactly not what Jesus does to us, thankfully. You see, Jesus is not tasting each one of us and say, well, okay, (laughs) I I think I could commit a little more for you. And somebody else, well, I think I'm done with you. I mean, it's, it's, it would, would have been easy for Paul to focus on Philippian church or Ephesians, Ephesus church, the church in Ephesus. Why bother with the Corinthian church? Why bother? It has said. It's the nature of Christ's love for us. Um, I'm pretty much done with time, so uh, I can't continue with the rest of the message. I didn't say a whole lot, but um, I think here Paul commits to two things that he's going to do 
when he does go to Corinth, he says the first thing that he wants to do, which is stated in chapter 12, verse 19, all for your upbuilding and up- upbuilding, beloved. The word edification, oikonome, that's the first reason I go. And I'll just make it very short. The reason why he went to Corinth is so that they will follow through with what they promised. You know what that was? A year ago they said, we will give generously for the sake of relief to the, giving relief to the Jerusalem church who's suffering financially badly. So the church in Achaia, Corinth church said a year ago, we will make that collection. They didn't. <laughs> Wouldn't it be easier for Paul to say, well, you didn't, so forget it. And, and there are many times when I've asked people to do something and they say yes and they haven't done it. And I just said, forget it because I'm not going to bother with it. Maybe people have done that to me as well, you know. Because somehow we've lost this sense of integrity. Paul saying to the Corinthian church, I'm going to go and follow through with you even if you accuse me of robbing you. That's what he said in earlier chapter 12. Some of you tell me that I really have a financial aim. You know I don't. You know that what I'm doing is I'm going to take your offering in order to relieve those people who are in need. You promised it. You better do it. You made a vow. Do it. Paul calls this the building up. It's the edification. It's like building a building. You put a firm foundation. You set up pillars. You put walls. You put roof on top. Building is set, right? It looks pretty good. That's what you call integrity. Jesus said, a wise man hears my word and he obeys. Not only he hears, but he obeys. A foolish man hears my word and they forget. And wise man builds a house that's firm. So when storms come, floods come, the house stands. But the unwise, foolish man, the house collapses. Why? Because the edification had not happened. What Paul's telling them is this. Hey, not only are you saved from damnation to hell, you are saved to an eternal glory as God's people, as men and women who's taking on the very character of Christ. This is important, right? Not only are we saved from something, we are saved to something. We are taken out of the kingdom of darkness, but we have come into the kingdom of light. We are no longer enslaved to sin and death, but now we are, what? The servants of the righteousness and life. We are saved away from something bad, but we are saved into something great. And that's what Paul's saying. Hey, look, you're saved. You're a church. One thing you got to have is an edification. The way you build your house is by integrity. That is what? You promise something, you follow through. Be faithful to your promise. Integrity, a sense of consistency, a sense of endurance. I think it's very possible that we become so callous in our hearts and our conscience that we simply abandon one responsibility to the next and we end up feeling nothing. You walk around as if nothing's wrong, but knowing full well that you have betrayed your promise to a woman that you loved. You have betrayed the love that you have committed to your congregation or any particular responsibility that you might have been established for. You simply walk away and say, well, what? I mean, yes, there are times when we make things wonderful in terms of resolution and moving on to something different, but we're talking about these permanent things, things that God had called us to We, we can easily become calloused. We could become hardened. What does Christ do? Christ continues to probe us by awakening our conscience, by 
speaking to us through his word and also by stirring up our circumstance and situations. Our life becomes shaken by something that God does. Sometimes that's very painful and difficult, but it's a way that the Lord sometimes, oftentimes in his sovereign grace, a way to awaken our deadened conscience, a way to break our hardened hearts, a way to wake up or awaken our deaf, deaf ears. There's something that the Lord continues to do. That's what our Jesus Christ does. The Lord is a good shepherd. Jesus said, I am a great shepherd. And that famous Psalm 23 says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you know, if you know anything about shepherding, well, I don't know really much, but I read in commentaries that, you know, rod and staff, comfort, they're not comforting. Staff is there to bring you in when you are going astray by a strike. Rod is like a goad. It pokes you from behind when you are sitting still and not moving. Shepherd continues to work in us. One other thing that Paul said he's going to do um, when he comes is in 13 verse 9, for we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. Your restoration, actually, I think it's not the best translation. The better translation would be your completion. The word there is definitely something about finishing up, closing, bring it to perfection. This is what Paul said to the Philippian church. God who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what Paul has in mind here is that the reason why I'm going the third time is because I need to make sure that the house is standing. House of your Christian life, the house of your church, meaning, you know, I'm not talking about physical house, you know that, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build this, make sure that your edification is done, right? There is that sense of integrity. But second, sec, on top of it, there will be a completion, and completion, in reference to completion in chapter 13, he talks about undone, undone repentance. Sins that linger, sins that remain. Paul says, I will come and address that. This is what we might call the mortification of sin, like what the Puritans have said. It's the details. You know, when you build a house, you don't just build the wall and the roof and say, this is done. That's, that's really not even half done. You know what you have to do. You need to do all the internal work. Driving by this morning by the farm park and there's new uh, townhouse that's going up, well, partially gone up and there's new section going up and they've been building through the corona uh, and uh, working very hard outside. But I looked today and nothing was done inside. The window's all set up, but inside it's still... You know, you need to put up the HVAC, you need to do the living room, you need to do the bedrooms, you need to do the difficult construction of building a kitchen, bathroom, a lot of details. And Christian life takes you there. You identify sins in your life and you bring it to death by nailing it to the cross with Jesus. Something about God's desire, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are God's workmanship. God continues to work in us, to shape us, to glory. He's not done with us. Don't expect things to end where God is not committed to you and you just walk around like a zombie. The Lord is working. You know, one of the glorious reformed doctrine is the perseverance of saints. Some people consider that a wrongly phrased. Saints don't persevere. God preserves 
So let's call it the preservation of saints, not perseverance of saints. Once God saves you, he will never let you go. Beautiful doctrine. We don't have power to stay on. God must do it. But I'll still preserve that word, perseverance of saints. But I would put it this way. Well, it is not really the saints who persevere. It is Jesus Christ who perseveres with us. So in him, we persevere to the end until we reach glory. May the Lord be so delighted to make you and I his workmanship. And let's not be passive about it. Let's not sit there just taking it as if you have no interest in it. Let's reclaim our integrity. Let's work on the details of our sins. And don't say, I'm just tired. I just don't want to do this. Well, ultimately, what God is asking you is to be receptive. Be actively receptive. That your faith. Examine yourself to see if you're in faith. How do we do that? Well, is Jesus really all in all for you and in you? Is Christ working in your life? And are you receptive to that? Or are you just not? I think there are a lot of people who use religion and fail. I don't know whether there is salvation in that. Christianity is not to be used and then abandoned. It is a kind of commitment you're entering in, whether you, where you give your life utterly to the Lordship of Jesus who will never give you up. It's a, it's a weird thing, but that's what we're in for. So embrace it. Let's pray. Father, 